So you have to continuously cultivate these um, aspects of integrity in your practice because the second you let it slip, the easier it's going to be to bypass it. You know, see if you can slip it under the rug and just get away from it or get away with it. Um, and odds are nobody's going to catch you. Odds are nobody's going to call you out on it. And they'll never know. Um, but you got to live with that. You, you got to know, you know, and I just, I'm one of those people where I, I don't want to have any regrets. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Emergency Nursing podcast. This is where we share stories for inspiration, entertainment, and encouragement, because we all know emergency nurses have the best stories. Now here's your host, Kevin McFarland. Hey everybody, Kevin McFarland here from the Art of Emergency Nursing, and thanks as always for downloading this episode and for listening to the podcast. Just as a reminder, if you haven't done so already, please leave a rating and review for the podcast. That's one way that you can help the podcast out and help other nurses like you find a podcast like this. And as always, don't forget to share with your friends, your family, the people you like, even the people you don't like. I have a great episode planned for you today. My guest today became a little bit of a mentor to me when I first started my first foray into being a nursing clinical instructor. She was my go-to resource whenever I had questions or concerns and was always happy to take my call and always provided great advice. My guest today is a longtime ER nurse and forensic nurse, and then after all that became a high school teacher. This may be the bravest woman you've ever met. Since the time of this recording, her career has hit a new summit as the education manager for the Sigma organization. You are going to love this episode with my friend, the future Dr. Paige Owen. Enjoy. My name is Paige Owen. Um, my first name is Christian. So um, I have to clarify because nobody ever calls me Christian. Um, I am part of the clinical faculty for Sizzik School of Nursing in Houston, Texas. And it's my dream job. Um, I've worked really hard to get there and I feel like I've hit the summit of my career right now. Um, I was born in Amarillo, Texas. And uh, West Texas girl. Um, so red dirt is in my roots. And uh, yeah, my, my nursing journey has been primarily emergency nursing. And uh, I did forensic nursing for a while. And I taught high school to get my feet wet in education. And, um, and I fell in love with it. And I knew, okay, you got to go back to school and get ready to, to teach in the big leagues. So um that's kind of what brought me to where I am now. That's super cool. So, so as a nurse, you went back and taught high school? I Boy, did. that's brave. <laughs> oh, oh, that pay cut hurt too. <laughs> that it did. So you went, so you went full yeah. time, you went teaching full time. I did. I was, I was a um, certified secondary teacher in the state of Texas. I had to go through the whole, um, you know, teacher certification training and I taught health science and uh, in that role, I was required to have my RN. So um, I taught medical terminology to sophomores in high school. I did clinical rotations with students in the hospital setting um, in their junior and senior year. And then I got on board with um, the local EMS agency and did my EMT basic training through them and started training uh, high school seniors to become EMT basics. Too. How cool is that? It was amazing. I loved it. That's super cool. We did a program like that back in New Mexico where we had, um, we taught a group of first responders. We taught a high school group. For, first, we taught the high school group first, first responder. Then they decided they wanted to teach EMT basic, but they had to be certified teachers to teach it. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up doing is we ended up doing an instructor class for these high school teachers that were, you know, health that or whatever else they were. And we taught them, mm -hmm. we did a, an EMT basic class first, and then we did uh, a, an instructor class. And it was the first time yeah. I ever got a chance to teach an instructor class. And oh my God, it was so much fun. But like, yeah. how do you teach an instructor class to teachers? Like it's, it's not, it's a different class than it would have been otherwise. It was kind of like, okay, here's how you teach this stuff. Um, yeah. You know, and, and kind of like, okay, here's, here's the skill. Let me show you some cool things about the skill, but you know, yeah. the teaching part, like they're, they're like, yeah. you're not going to tell theory, teaching theory and teaching about writing a test or defending they a test or whatever. You're like, you don't need any of that no, stuff. No, they don't care about that. No? That, I mean, that was, so I also did teen cert 
and um, you know, community emergency response training. And I went to a train the trainer course in Dallas. And I mean, I had been a nurse for about eight years and um, I was just kind of seeing what all can I do with this? Um, and teen cert is so much fun. I mean, cert training is super fun, but teen cert was awesome um, because they had all of these different disaster situations that we could do with the students. And um, so we did that for a while. And, um, you know, with health science, a lot of the high schools now that have programs in CTE, they also have what's called HOSA. And that's kind of the it's not an external or extracurricular club because it's really intertwined with the curriculum. And so we called it an intracurricular club. And, you know, I had students that were competing in EMT basic skills against other students all over the country. How cool um, was that? Yeah, same thing with, you know, our CNA students that we had, um, CERT. I mean, we had, you know, kids competing with CERT. I mean, it was just, it, uh, it opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, oftentimes we think that if we introduce certain concepts at that level, they may not get it, but holy cow, was I wrong. Um, and the cool thing, I mean, that was back in 2016 it is when I transitioned out of that role. Um, but most of those students that I taught have gone into health careers. I've got several nurses now, um, firefighters, medics. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. And it opened your eyes to the impact of, wow, you know, these, this is really where it starts. Um, you know, you kind of light the fire in them and then see where they go. And the really cool thing about that, we were talking about full circle. I was a HOSA brat in high school. Oh, no kidding. And so I did clinicals and I still remember my HOSA instructor. And uh, she was a nurse and, you know, I had a couple family members that were also nurses that inspired me to go in that direction. But, um, you know, it's just the world wants you to succeed. You know, the universe is in your favor. It's For just sure. whether or not you allow, you know, those little nudges to push you down the road. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. So how long have you been a nurse? I was, I graduated in 2007, so I'm getting ready to, well, 15 years. Good for, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I graduated really from the same place that I'm teaching now. So, I mean, it's just. <laughs> that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of cool. I always thought, I always thought I would end up teaching nursing at the, the, the school where I got my nursing, my associate's degree. I always thought I would end up teaching there. And, and when I decided to dip my, my toes in the, the teaching waters. Um, I actually got a letter of recommendation from the, the program manager there, which Aww. she gave me like this glowing recommendation. And I was like, oh my gosh. And she was like, I'm just jealous that he's with you and not with us. And I was like, yeah, how cool is that? That's, That's amazing. Super cool. Yeah. yeah. So why nursing? You said you had a couple of family members who were nurses or in, in nursing. What? Why yeah. nursing? Uh, you know, I think there are some people that have just kind of always known that that was their bag. And I think I'm one of those people. Um, I always had a, a love of science um, in high school. I, I loved working with people and I loved anatomy. I mean, I just loved learning about what your body does. And so whenever I got into high school, um, you know, and I was able to do um, that program, it just kind of confirmed it for me. But, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, I was at a private school, um, my middle school years through half of my junior year. And I begged my parents, please let me go to public school, please, please, please. And, um, they finally agreed. And so I moved to a public school, my junior year, halfway through my junior year. And you talk about a rough transition when you've been in a very small private school where your graduating class would have been like 15 people. Wow. And um, so I just kind of said, you know what, I, if I want to go anywhere with this, um, I need to, I need to get some more bigger. And so that's what I did. Um, but as far as my family, um, when I graduated high school, in 2007, my cousin, who I'm really close to, graduated from nursing school the same year, and she became an ER nurse. 
in the Dallas area. Well, Amarillo first, and then she moved to the Dallas area. And um, she's always been kind of that inspiration for me. You know, in, in high school, you know, I'd talk to her. She'd tell me about all these crazy stories, you know, that she saw. And, hey, you would never guess what I saw in the ER the other day. You would have loved it. And so I kind of, she was fueling the fire, I think. And uh, I mean, we're all guilty of it. We want all of everybody to go into ER nursing because it's the best totally. of nursing. So right. it's the coolest. Yeah. It's the coolest so she by was far. doing her by due far. diligence to lean me in that direction. And it worked. Um, you know, and I just, she has, she's single and she loves life. Um, she's in Alaska right now. Um, she lives up in this little cabin in the woods and she, she does dog races. <laughs> and, you know, when you talk about like the Iditarod and things like that, that she does yeah. that, that's what she trains to do now. That's and cool. So just, she always had a flair for adventure and, you know, it, uh, it just, she sucked me in and. I kind of fell in her footsteps and I'm so glad I did. Um, she pinned me, um, in my graduation. Um, That's awesome. yeah. So, and then I have an aunt who's an OR nurse and she's been an OR nurse as long as I've been born. And she, um, she kind of gave me the different side of it. The more of, you know, wow, you know, think about the responsibility you have over these people that are trusting you. And it's such yeah. a powerful thing. And, so I got a pretty good dose of the affective touchy feely side of nursing. And Hey, I went to Morocco and I went to, you know, I followed this patient around and they paid me all this money just to sit there and give them oxygen. It was amazing. And just like, what? what? How cool is that? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it just opened my eyes to what all you can do with nursing too. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of different options. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. I think so. I was telling some nurses just recently, I said, you know, if you get tired of ER nursing, you can always go do something else. Mm -hmm. Like there's a million different things you can do with your nursing. I say, I tell people all the time, I said, it really is the, you know, the RN is really the golden ticket. You yeah. do anything you want to do. Oh, I totally agree. Um, totally agree. Like you can, you, can, you can completely do something completely different and still be a nurse. Uh -huh. but, Absolutely. But no matter what kind of nursing I was doing, though, I always like if people ask me, they'd be like, what kind of nurse are you? I, I, my answer is always I'm an ER nurse. Yeah. And even even if I was even if I was doing, you know, something that wasn't ER at all, I was like, I'm, I'm an ER nurse. And, and and it's like, oh, OK, like, I guess that just ended up becoming you know, who I am and my identity, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it's just kind of funny that how that works. Yeah. Like, you end up with a type of nursing. That's kind of what you do. And yeah. No. It's just, you, you, it's what you end up identifying with. Yeah, absolutely. So did, did you start in the ER or did you start somewhere else? I did. Else? Um, you know, I was, I say I was an older student. So whenever I got done with high school, um, <clears throat> you know, I went to college and I had way, way, way too much fun and um, stopped going to class and ended up with a GPA of like 1.6. And yeah, my parents were not happy. Um, and I, you know, I did a lot of really stupid, risky things um, in my early years. And, uh, you know, I, I look back and I'm like, man, somebody was watching over me because, man, some of the stuff you do when you're young and dumb and invincible, um, <laughs> I, I empathize with patients, you know, that I take care of because I'm like, man, I, I know what that was like. I did the same thing. I just got lucky enough to survive it and get through it and not get arrested. <laughs> um, yeah, but, um, you know, I met my husband and we, um, we got married and had a baby, uh, very quickly after we got married, if you catch my drift. And, um, then I think I grew up real fast. I mean, cause I, I was, I was 19 when I had my oldest daughter. And Holy yeah, cow. and so um, you kind of realize that you you are now responsible for somebody, and it rocks your world. And I had a lot of family support, thank goodness. And um, we ended up moving to Houston in 2002, 
and you know from a very small podunk town like Amarillo and where I had all of my family support there and moving to the big city um, it was it was a crazy time and I was kind of trying to adjust to the thought of, well, can I be a housewife? I'll be a stay-at-home mom and I'll cook and I'll go to the PTA meetings. And I just realized that was not who I am. <laughs> I couldn't do it. And um, we were at a gas station. I can't remember what we were doing, but we were at a gas station and um, my daughter was in the back seat. And Matt ran in to grab something. And I remember sitting in the gas station in the passenger side and a nurse walked out of the gas station, full scrubs. And I mean, you could tell she probably had just gotten off shift and stopped or whatever on the way home. And I, it just hit me like a bolt of lightning. It's like, get back to school, like get back on the road. You know, what are you doing? And so I thought, well, how am I going to do this? Like, we are broke. We have no money. I've got a baby. I don't know anybody in Houston. Um, we had Matt's parents um, and family here, so they were really supportive. But um, I just started saying, okay, well, let me go look at community college and uh, at least start taking some classes. And so that's kind of where I um, really got rolling with nursing and um, I did all my prereqs at the community college, saved a ton of money and um, just started saying yes to every opportunity that I thought was gonna advance me forward. Um, I was a volunteer in the hospital um, and I volunteered in the ER and I loved nice. it. Um, and it just kind of confirmed what I thought was gonna be my path all along and then um, at that time, I mean, getting into nursing school was super competitive. Um, it still is. And I was really lucky that I was able to get into UT and um, the rest is kind of history. Um, but yeah, at high school, or not high school, high acuity um, rotations, I was able to be in the ER. Um, and that was my last semester, getting ready to graduate. And uh, just once again, it's like, man, this is, this is my gig. And I had some fantastic preceptors um, who were super encouraging and really helped uh, give me the why behind what they did. And, um, and they said, you know, you really ought to apply here. And I'm like, yeah, but it's not a trauma center. And I really want trauma. And they're like, well, okay, but you might as well apply. And so I applied to all the trauma centers in town because I wanted to do trauma. And um, I ended up getting a job there in the non-trauma facility. And um, I remember uh, talking to the director and I'm like, hey, so I'm getting ready to graduate. I really like, you know, the staff. I think they really like me too. What, what do I need to do to get a job here? And she's like, well, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. You know, keep me, keep me informed. You know, I'll send you the link to the application. And it ended up being this thing where, you know, I just need to start asking so I literally knocked on her door like every couple of weeks. Hey, when are you going to hire me? Hey, when are you going to hire me? <laughs> and she did. Um, so I started as a new That's grad awesome. in one of the first nurse residency programs in a major system um, here in Houston. And uh, I'm so glad. I mean, I could not have asked for a better introduction to nursing, introduction to the ER, Um and I think it just, once again, you know, it, it confirmed that that's where I was meant to be. That's and, really cool. Uh, and the universe was on my side. So. Kind of funny how that works out, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I still keep in touch with, um, with my first director. I mean, she's still there. And. Um, wow. It's just neat. That's impressive. That's something you don't hear every day. No. And she was a nurse's director. I mean, she was our biggest advocate. Um, anything we needed, she pushed it forward. She's like, well, listen, they need this. They need extra staff. They need new equipment. They need this. Um, and I think that spoke volumes to the type of person that she was and the type of nurse that she is. And, um, you know, like I said, I mean, you hear horror stories about, you know, people's first nursing jobs. And I, I had the best. I mean, I, 
the awesome. whole thing, my preceptors were amazing. Um, you know, it, it was a, it was a good transition for me, especially, that's you know, cause I had spent a whole semester there yeah. and then that's where I was going to work. Um, so it was a very easy transition for me. That's nice. That's very cool. So you said your, your first pro, your first place is a residency program. How'd you like the residency? Like, did it, how did it work out? Yeah. So, um, everybody in that, you know, location, we were all kind of put together. So there was a big group of new grads and every month we would meet and, you know, we, we learn about different aspects of the hospital, um, the values we'd learn about expectations for competency, um, the clinical ladder, things like that. Um, in the nurse residency program, we didn't do a whole lot of, you know, nurse education. It was more helping us um, identify what are, what, are, what are the values that this, you know, system has? What are the expectations? What are the opportunities for you to grow? Um, so I thought it was really cool um, because I really felt at home. You know, I really felt accepted into that uh, facility and, you um, on the flip side, you know, in the ER, I had an educator that um, was very big on education specifically for the ER. Um, so she used some of the early training via ENA. And so we did some of the online modules through uh, ENA and that's where we really dug into systems. And, um, you know, so I did that for about the first year. Um, wow, that's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Do you remember when you made your first med error? Oh my gosh. I tell my students this all the time. Um, it was so bad. So stupid too. I was probably three or four months in maybe. And you're kind of at that phase where you know your, your unit, you know where everything is. You've got the EMR down and you're getting a little cocky. Um, because you're feeling really good about yourself. You're finally feeling yeah, like, like I've, I got, I've got this. this, you know, and I, I look like I'm smart now. I don't look like a student anymore. Uh, and um, we were busy and I pulled um, Bentle um, for my patient because they were having, you know, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. And I uh, drew up that Bentle and I gave it IV. And yeah, oh yeah. And I didn't even realize it um, because at the time we didn't have computers in the room. You know, this is before barcode scanning. And so I, uh, I, I didn't realize I had made the med error until I went back to document it right outside the patient's room. And I looked at the route and I had gotten the route wrong. And you talk about gut wrenching, just a gut wrench, like the whole world just starts caving down on top of you. And, um, and I kind of was thinking, okay, you know, go to your drug book, <laughs> you know, what are the side effects, you know, look, look for everything you can about this drug. And I've given that before. That's the crazy thing. I should have known better. Um, but I got in a hurry and I uh, got too cocky. And I, I remember telling my charge nurse, um, who I was, you know, really close to, I'm like, listen, I just really screwed up. And, um, my patient was already on the cardiac monitor. So I knew my patient was, you know, okay. And based on what I had looked up, you know, it's, it wasn't going to be something where they were just going to, you know, it's not like pushing potassium or something like that, but, um, the fear of telling somebody I screwed up, um, yeah. you know, and then really they teach you about integrity in nursing, um, but having to own it and do the right thing. You know, that's when you're really testing. Oh, it's hard. You know, can you do the right thing? And so it wasn't me just telling my charge nurse, then I had to tell the ER physician so that we could, you know, continue monitoring. And, oh, that was bad. That was terrible. That That's the worst feeling in the world. And he was so gracious. Um, he's like, listen, we've all, we've all been there. You know, we, we just, we're gonna monitor this patient. He goes, but we need to go tell the patient. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> and I, so it was just like this triple whammy of, uh. oh, and I remember 
you know, going in and telling the patient, Hey, listen, there's something I need to tell you. Um, I, I gave you a medication, um, that the doctor had ordered and it's going to help with your abdominal pain, your cramping, but I, I gave it through your IV and I should have given it to you, um, as a shot. And, um, and, and we're going to watch, you know, and monitor. I, we don't think that there's going to be any major, you know, negative impact from this, but I, I have to tell you, I have to be honest that I, I made this mistake and I am so incredibly sorry. And of course the ER doc was there, charge nurse was there. So now I have an audience on top of that. Uh, <clears throat> and uh. obviously the patient was upset, um, rightfully so. And, um, you know, but I think the fact that we disclosed that in the way that we did, um, really kind of made things easier. And, um, you know, the patient asked for a different nurse and I said, I, I, I understand. And man, then like just the rejection, you know, the patient was very gracious and, but asked for a different nurse and, yeah, like, say I'll be nice about yeah. it, but we're going yeah. to get some. Who was I to say? Who was I to say that that wasn't the right thing for her to do? I mean, I, you know, and that that probably was a good thing because I really had to take a few moments. I sat in the charge nurse office and cried for probably an hour. You know, just the mix of guilt and you're so stupid. Why did you do that? Why did you get in a hurry? And why didn't you look it up? And you know, but yeah. that was a pretty defining point in my career though. Um, and I think most nurses feel that way um, when they make their first med air. Um, number one, I have a really good story to tell about integrity and in nursing. I mean, I easily, easily looking back and knowing what I know now, I could have totally brushed that under the rug. Patient would have been fine. Yeah. Uh, just they were on the cardiac monitor anyway. Um, yeah. you know, and, uh, and looking back, I mean, I definitely took the harder road, but it was the right thing to do. And I think when you're put under that yeah. pressure, um, you know, it's a, it's a real test of who you are. Um, so I'm glad I did the right thing. Boy, did it suck walking through that. That was a, that was terrible. But now I can tell my students, Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you why you need to do your five medication rights or seven or 20, however many verification steps we do. However now. many there are now. Yeah. Um, and I tell yeah. them that story. And then we talk about integrity in nursing and being professional and doing the hard things, um, especially when it's hard, you know, doing the right thing when it's hard. Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, it, you know, it sucked. But um, I've always kind of had to learn lessons the hard way. And so it, <laughs> you know, what can you do? You live and you learn. Understand. That's right. Now, how do you handle it? So how do you handle it when you see, when you're there, because now in, in, your, in your instructor role, yeah. when you're there with your students and you're seeing them and you're, you're watching them watch somebody else practice their practice and you see them doing something that you're like, I would never, ever do that. How do you handle that without like making a scene and be like, wait, hold yeah. on, what are you? Yeah. Because you can't you can't make a scene, but no. you but you're, you you want to be like, you want to be like, okay, like let's not do this. You have Here's to why. have some finesse as an instructor, you know, especially if you're you know on site in the hospital with students. Um, you know, I, I tell my students very early on, you know, once they're tag teamed with me as their clinical instructor, I'm like, listen you're going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And all of it is equally important for you. And when you see the bad and the ugly, I need you to make sure that I'm there with you so that I can number one, validate your thought process as, Hey, this doesn't look right. This is there, is that the right way we do this? Because I want to be there to walk you through that. Um, and I want to be able to explain to you why, yep. so that you can then use that to shape your practice and not practice that way. Um, but you know, um, mm -hmm. with clinical placement, especially now, you know, and in, in the world of COVID, um, we have to recognize the fact that, um, we're a guest and, um, placement could easily be taken away at any moment. And, um, 
So we have to be very careful yep. um, and walk that fine line. But um, we uh, try to think, there was one this semester actually where uh, I can't remember the exact story, but it was a technicality thing. So this nurse was doing something technically wrong and um but it wasn't going to cause harm to the patient it just you don't do it that way anymore and so the students saw and they were like hey listen um my nurse did this um you know what what's going on like I thought we were told not to do that I'm like well you're right (laughs) we no longer do that um and it it brought forth a pretty good conversation about how you know this is one of the bad and the ugly things um and so I think if you, if you put that in front that, you know, you're not going to walk into a hospital and everything be perfect there, you have to have the discernment to be able to decide that's the type of nurse based on what I've seen that I want to be like, and that I don't want to do that, you know, but as a new grad, so much. Yeah. as a nursing student, especially, they don't know, you don't know what you don't know. It's true. Um, it's so I true. think we have a really important role to guide them as to, um, you know, this is, it's not, it's not going to kill the patient, you know, and we're not going to call this nurse out on it, but, um, you know, and I just, I was always the type where if we were having this conversation to clarify practice areas that I would have it really close to that nurse so that maybe she might overhear our conversation just a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and that happened a couple of times and it was a really cool conversation because then they're like, Oh, well, I didn't realize we didn't do that anymore. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's old, old practice. The evidence doesn't support that anymore. Yeah. Oh, what's the new practice. Oh and my then gosh. you get to teach them too. And then your nurse, your student is right there watching all of it. And they're like, yeah, how did you know that? I'm like, you just, it's the finesse. Yeah. You know, I could, I could call that nurse out and embarrass her and, you know, be like some of the notorious instructors that we probably had in nursing school that would probably do that. But I never wanted to be that way. I mean, um, my job is to help you learn and bridge that gap and not embarrass you, not make you feel vulnerable. You already feel vulnerable enough as it is. Yeah, absolutely. I found, I found in my, my first uh, foray as a nursing clinical instructor, watching practice and going, do that um and then and then having those conversations with the students saying here's so here you know here here's what here's what you need to know like what you need to know is is this is what they're doing this seems to be an accepted practice amongst a few of these nurses and but but here's why here's why it's a bad call yeah it really made for kind of an uh, an awkward conversation but it was also like a good education too And, uh, and really what it gave me a chance to kind of come back to is Say, okay, how are you going to be when you want to do the right thing? Like, how, how's your integrity going to be when you want to do the right thing? But, but people don't do it the right way around you. Yeah. Like, are you going to conform and do it the way they do it? Or are you going to keep doing it the way you were taught in the way that's right and the way that, that fits the policy? And, yeah. Oh, and God bless ER nurses. We are the best at finding workarounds. Oh, 100%, 110%. Like, we will find every workaround possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but it's also one of those things, but, but we also know when it's not okay and when it's not going to work and then when it's not, yeah. like, it's just not safe to do. Yeah. So. Yeah. That, and, um, you know, I think that there's this pressure that we have to know everything, you know, I mean, as ER nurses, like we, that's one of our talents. We have oh. to be quick on our feet and think quick on our feet. And if we are faced with something, we're like, holy crap, I, I don't know. Like, ooh, I or I haven't done that in like a year. Um, and you're trying to brush up on the fly. Yeah. You're like, I have um, no idea, but let's figure it out. You know, it, it's, there's a lot of pressure to hide, you know, that awkwardness and to hide that vulnerability. And so um, it, <laughs> I, I have three rules for clinical and they've slowly morphed into like life mottos for me. Um, but the first is eat breakfast always no excuses because if you can't feed yourself, how the heck are you going to take care of anybody else? You know, and it's, 
I tell students that just because I mean, I've had a few that passed out, you know, midday because they hadn't had any glucose. And so their sugar was dropping like crazy. Um, and they learn pretty quick. Um, and I've learned to carry protein bars in my backpack everywhere with me um, for that reason. Yeah. Um, but also, That's funny. Um, you know, I don't know, it's, it's self-care. I mean, if we can't take care of ourselves, who are we to take care of other people? Um, and that self-sacrificing behavior that we, we do because we're so passionate about taking care of other people, um, you know, it can kind of flip us to where we stop taking care of ourselves and then that's dangerous, but so, yeah, so eat breakfast, always it's awesome, uh, always, uh, no excuses. And then the second one is just embrace the awkwardness of being a nursing student. Um, because we've all been there. And everything right now is going to be awkward because it's new and you're going to be put in situations where um, there's no way to train you for it. You just have to experience it. You know, that first sad conversation that you have with your patient, how can I train you? You know, you just have to be in the moment and learn the moment. Yeah. And then the last one um, is uh, give yourself permission to be there and be present. Because you are, most of the time, you are your biggest barrier <laughs> because you're hypercritical and you're scared and you're telling yourself that, oh gosh, I'm so stupid. Oh gosh, I, I don't know this. I'm, I'm never going to be able to figure all this stuff out. Um, and that prevents you from being in the moment and being open to learning the opportunities. So, um, so you know, it kind of goes back to the good, the bad, the ugly you know, you're going to feel awkward. You're not going to know what to say. You're going to be put in positions that really kind of test your integrity, test your, <laughs> um, I don't know. It just, I want to keep it simple for them, but I want them to realize that Kali, you are not a glorified waitress or waiter. You know, you've got to really, this is your practice and we call it practice for a reason you're never going to, you're never going to be perfect. Um, so you have to continuously cultivate these, um, aspects of integrity in your practice, because the second you let it slip, the easier it's going to be to bypass it, you know, see if you can slip it under the rug and just get away from it or get away with it. Um, and odds are nobody's going to get you. Odds are nobody's going to call you out on it and they'll never know. Um, but you got to live with that. You, you got to know, you know, and I just, I'm one of those people where I, I don't want to have any regrets, you know. It, you be our own worst enemy and, and also be our own worst critic. Like you'll beat yeah. yourself up all day long. Or if you just said, Hey, you know what, guess what? Here's what happened. You know, you, you'll, you'll never be as hard on you. No one will ever be as hard on you as you are on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, and the sad thing about that is it totally stunts your growth, totally stunts your, because then you kind of just That's live just in this fear is. and paranoia of, well, you know, what if that happens again? What if I'm faced to, you know, with that type of decision again, I, I don't want to put myself out there anymore. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. And that, that's what's so sad to me because I think, you know, I, we've all experienced those moments. I mean, I, I certainly experienced yeah. that as a new grad especially with that med error. And uh, if it weren't for, you know, people that were able to step in and be like, listen, we know this happens. It's happened to me. I'm really kind of help you transition through just such a terrible experience. Um, they teach you how to respond to those things. And they let you know, hey, I'm, listen, I'm right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be right here with you. We're going to get through this. And hopefully you'll learn your lesson and not do that again. But if it does happen, this is what you need to do every time. So I was really, like I said, I mean, I was really blessed with great, um, great people that, um, that raised me in the ER. Yeah. And they had high expectations which is great because I'm super competitive. I don't want to beat everybody else. I want to be the best. But it also trained me to realize what's important. It's not just about, you know, doing orders and giving shots and so much more. Yeah.
It's true. Awesome. So much more than that. Tell me about a patient that you'll never forget. Um, one is just an amazing, hilarious story. Um, but the other one is what led me down to, um, to become a forensic nurse. I was just off of orientation. So I was probably a year in and um, I was working day shift. I think I was working day shift. Yeah. And I had a, a patient that came in and um, she had said that, you know, she had just gotten the crap beat out of her by her boyfriend and double black eyes. Um, I think she had fractured her jaw um, as the hairline fracture. Um, she just looked terrible. And she was probably, you know, in her early twenties. So she was young. So we were kind of in the same age and um, she was being very matter of fact about everything um, and only giving what we asked for um, and very stoic. And I found it really odd, um, you know, and I, I felt I wasn't getting all the story from her. There was, there was something that uh, was preventing her from sharing the story. Um, so I was super busy, um, with like four other patients. And I just, I told my charge nurse, I'm like, Hey, something's not right. I just, my gut's telling me that I need to figure out what's going on here, that this is not just, you know, a physical assault. And, um, so she's like, all right, she's like, I'll cover your other patients, you know, go in there, do what you need to do and, and let me know when you get done. And so I, I spent about 10 minutes, um, in her room, just say, Hey, listen, I'm, I just want you to know that I'm, I'm here to help you. How, how can I help you? And, um, really trying to build up enough rapport. Cause just, you know, your gut tells you something's up, something's not right. Um, and always listen to your gut. Yeah. And so, um, so she ended up telling me all of the horrible things that this guy had not just done to her that day, but had been doing to her for months. And, um, and she had a kid at home and she was terrified that, um, something was going to happen to her kid if she tried to leave. Uh. And, um, you know, and, and we didn't have, um, a sane team at that time in the hospital. I mean, we just, you know, we call law enforcement and they come in and they do their thing. And then it was when, you know, if, if the patient said that they wanted a sexual assault <laughs> kit, then we would have to read the instructions on the box and walk through that. And it, it's terrible. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, and she said that she didn't want to do any of that. She just wanted to make sure that her jaw was okay. And, um, and by the time we got done with that conversation, you know, I said, well, you know, are you safe to go home? And she's like, well, I'll, I'll I don't know. And I said, I'm, I'm your nurse. I'm like, it is my responsibility to make sure that you can go home safe. Um, and she's like, that's, that's not your problem. And I said, no, I said, it is my problem. I said, I, I can't let you go knowing that you don't have a safe place to go. And I said, would you let me make some phone calls to see what we can do for you? And she's like, well, yeah, I mean, if, if you can, if you can figure it out and give me some resources. I mean, I, I, I don't want to go back to where he is. I'm like, good. I don't want you to either. Um, so I remember calling, you know, like the women's center nearby and, <clears throat> and I just, I felt like every resource I turned to was kind of like blowing it off as it, oh, it's not that big a deal you know, oh, is the patient discharged yet? She's been up for discharge for like 30 minutes. And I'm like, no, we, we cannot let her go home. She doesn't have a safe place to go to. She's terrified of this guy and for her kid. And um, so I, I made so many phone calls and um, finally was able to get her into um, a safe house with one of the women's services. And um you know, I mean, there was there wasn't a guide telling us what to do as an ER nurse. It was truly me, like looking for resources at that time, and figuring out what what options does she have. And um, 
the, the taxi ended up coming to pick her up. Um, we discharged and they were going to take her to the safe house and um, the taxi driver wouldn't tell me <laughs> where she was going. And I thought, well, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and I remember um, whenever I discharged her, um, knowing what the plan was and that she was in agreement to the plan. Um, she goes, you know, she goes, I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, she's like, I really thought I was just going to have to go back home and get the shit beat out of me again. And, um, and I said, no, I said, nobody deserves that. And, um, you know, like I said, I mean, I still remember her name. I remember her face. Um, I remember who I called and spoke to on the phone at the women's service or at the women's center. Um, you know, and from then on, I went to my chargers. I'm like, we have got to do something about this. If I had to like muddle through all of this shit to figure out what resources we could provide for this patient, how the heck are we going to treat the next person that comes in? with us? Yeah. How many are we missing? Yeah. And um, so we, we started really working to kind of get a better process for those types of patients. And that's what kind of led me towards uh, forensic nursing and being interested and in really trying to be an advocate for those types of patients. Um, so, so yeah. That's super and, cool. I, and I was one of those nurses that they're like, Hey, we need a sane kit. And I'm like, I'm not a sane. And they're like, yeah, but I mean, any ER nurse can do it. And the patient wants one. And you're the only one that really seems interested in doing that stuff anyway. And so, <laughs> You know, I basically got voluntold by my charge nurse, go in there and do that. Um, and, oh God, you talk about a terrible experience. I had no idea what I was doing. I was reading on, on the back of the box. Um, it was awful. It was awful for the patient. It was awful for me. Um, and I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to do this. This is not right. Um, so so I, I, I went and I got trained. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm never going to be in that situation where I don't know what I'm doing ever again. Um, and so I, um, it was, a, it was a few years later. Um, I had moved to a different hospital that had just opened up. So I got to open up a brand new hospital from the ground up, be part of the founding ER staff, which was really cool. Um, you know, the day before we opened the doors, we were putting together crash carts because nobody had thought to put together crash carts uh, for the year because nobody thought we'd need it on day one. I mean, you've, oh. you're not going to need it on day one. You're probably not going right. to see any patients. Well, like, I'd be okay. I you're shit right. you not. We intubated a patient on the first day. Wow. And, <laughs> you know, thank goodness <laughs> we had a crash card. But, and then I um, started doing some training. Um, with the OAG's office whenever I was at that hospital and um, completed all of my certification requirements. And um, then I, I really wanted to go where they had a really solid program. And I started training uh, for free with, uh, with one of the major forensic teams down here. And they had a, a dedicated forensic nurse response team. And uh, we were at a SANE, it was a training in Austin um, for those that wanted to be um, program directors for your SANE training. And I remember meeting who would become my boss and really hit it off with her. And I mean, she's one of the pioneers of, you know, forensic nursing. And I was there with my manager and she looked at my manager. She goes, I'm going to steal her. <laughs> like awkward. Um really awkward. Um, but sure enough, she did. And I ended up going a uh, full-time forensic nurse and man, it was amazing. That's cool. Yeah. Once again, I mean, just kind of the right place at the right time with the right people. And, um, I, it was a small team. Um, there was about 12 of us and we covered the entire Houston area. Cause this hospital system had, you know, at the time, 11 hospitals. Wow. And um, so we had certain hospitals that had all of our equipment, you know, at the hospital where we had our colposcope and the digital photography and all that stuff that goes along with it. Then we had hospitals that didn't quite have all that equipment. So we would bring the equipment to them um, and we would go where the patient was. And I loved that. Um, That's cool. 
It was very cool. And it was great for the patient because oftentimes, you know, they would be transferred to a hospital that had that program and you're taking them out of their community. And then you're like, well, okay, now you're being discharged, figure out how to get home. (laughs) You know, and and the follow-up sucked because you couldn't follow up within your community (laughs) because now you were like down in the med center. But at the same time, I mean, I was doing probably three exams a night because we would do 12 hour shifts. I usually did 5P to 5A. And then I transitioned Mm -hmm. to um, 1P to 1A. And then I moved into days 5A to 5P. Um, And at night there was supposed to be two of us, but we we were a small team. And so there was usually only one of us on call at night. And, um, you talk about time management and triage. I mean, thank God I had training on triage because, you know, there would be patients that were waiting for hours for one of us to get there. But, um, and we bring our bag, we roll our huge um, box that had our colposcope and our camera and all that stuff. I felt like a pack mule every time I walked into the hospital. Um, and as you're pulling this big black box, they were like, oh, it's the body box. I'm like, you could totally fit a body in here and nobody would ever know. Cause I'm the forensic nurse. <laughs> um, it's pretty funny. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So we'd set up in their room and we'd talk to the patient and go through all of the consents and make sure that, um, they were aware of their rights and, um, to report. And if they didn't want to report, we could still provide this exam for them to make sure that physically they were okay set them up with resources, um, collect the evidence. And, you know, it's just, it was so empowering to be able to number one, provide that type of service to patients and their most vulnerable state. And, and I remember telling people the most rewarding part of that job is I would walk in to rooms where these patients were absolutely broken and defeated. And in the course of a few hours, It's almost like you could see your patients do a 180, like, okay, you've just helped them gain control again. And you've given them, um, you know, the reassurance that they're going to be okay. And on top of that, you've provided them with a way to get out if this was a cycle for them. And some didn't take it, you know, and that, but that's their right. And I had to respect that, um, you know. So there, there were so many hard conversations in that job. Man, you talk about empowering and the most rewarding um, role I ever had. Um, so, but, but really hard. I mean, because if you're doing, uh, I did it for a year and a half independently. If you look at my training and all of the shadowing and stuff that I've been doing, I ended up doing forensics for about three years, three, four years. Yeah. And that's gotta be just an emotionally hard job. It was, it, it really was. It's gotta, Um, it's gotta just be hard to do for a long time. You know? Yeah. Um, it was technically, it was technically hard. I mean, you think about the most complicated procedure you have to do as an ER nurse, you know, and how, you know, that, oh man, unless you do it every single day, you know, it's going to be challenging because there's so many pieces of it. That was like every Mm -hmm. single exam. Like there was so much more than just following the steps because you had to cater it to number one, your patient's physical ability. And number two, whether or not they wanted that piece of it and how are you going to justify on the back end after it was all done? And if you got called to court, you know, how are you going to justify not doing that? Um, you know, it it was hard. It was so hard. Um, but the emotional part of it, you know, I mean, you're, you're living the trauma, you know, with those patients and, you know, as you're gathering their history and trying to really figure it out what, what happened to them and really building that rapport so that they feel open enough to talk to you about it. Um, man, it was rough. Um, and you had to be really on your game all the time. I bet. But yeah, I, you know, I, I still look back and I mean, I, I know that I struggle with um, some of the stories that we hear. I mean, there was a, you know, sitting in the room with a young girl, we're talking young, um, and 
she's telling you this story about how she got, you know, kidnapped from her front yard and um, she ended up being taken to a warehouse and she was assaulted and she realized the only way she was going to get out is if she tried to kill him. And so she stabbed a dude in the chest and took off running, didn't know where she was, oh. took off running and oh um, was able to, you know, call 911 and get out of there. And she's here in my ear and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, you know, um, but so there's a lot of stories like that. And of course, the ones that you had to follow to the OR because you're collecting evidence in the OR because they were so um, bad off from what happened to them. Um, you know, it just sucked, especially because we, we did adults, we did kids. Um, my youngest patient was a few weeks old. My oldest patient was 101. So it oh. ran the full gamut. Um, so yeah, it, it was... But I mean, the technicality of it, I mean, you're always on your game and your game was always changing just a little bit based on what the crime lab was doing because you were validated, you know, how, how good was your evidence collection techniques? You know, what was the crime lab able to pull off of your swabs that you did? Um, How is that going to change the way we did things um, to make it better for our patients? Um, So that was the really cool piece of it. I learned so much um, about the technical side of being a forensic nurse, but also, um, you know, it went back to kind of how much do you value humanity, you know, and, and what are yeah. you going to do when these patients are telling you these horrible, horrible things, um, that happened in the gutter of humanity? Um, and how are you going to respond to that? But, um, yeah, that's tough. It's tough to, it's tough to be able to how do you, what do you say? Yeah. It's like, well, and I think that's where that pressure, it, like, I have to know all the answers. You know, my patient asked me this, I have to be able to respond with something. And I learned in that role that sometimes there was nothing I could say that was going to make this situation better for this patient. No, there's nothing you can no, say. No, and I, it's going to make it yeah, better. And I just kind of had to, I really had to learn to listen, um, you know, and I'm huge on, um, you know, the physical touch and the power of touch and nursing. And I think that's one of the saddest things that we've seen, you know, during COVID is that we haven't been able to connect with our patient, you know, physically, just because we're covered in PPE. I mean, they, they don't even know what we look like. You know, I had to be in, in those patients' rooms where, you know, listen, I'm, I can't, I don't even know what to say. I'm so terribly sorry this has happened to you. But I want you to know I'm here and I am your advocate and I am I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that you are physically okay yeah. and that you have the resources you need so that you can be emotionally okay after this. And your yeah. safety is my biggest priority. Um, and in, in order to do that, you really got to try to connect with the patient. That connection yeah. is hard. So, the, and, but that's the piece that I loved. Um, some of your most challenging patients are your adolescent patients. And, um, you know, they're like getting them to talk to you is like breaking into Fort Knox. I mean, sometimes they don't want to tell you anything. Um, yeah. So the challenge of that and being able to really connect with those, those patients, um, so powerful, such a, such an amazing, um, privilege. And that's, I was humbled every day going into that job, but, um, that's cool. Yeah. We had a pager and we would wear the pager, you know, when we were on call. And, um, pager goes off, you know, you call in, they tell you what they need you to do. And then you'd either go to the hospital and do it, or you'd go to the hospital, pick up your equipment and then go where the patient was. <clears throat> and I started noticing a trend. Um, you know, me and my husband, we'd be sitting down watching the news and I'd hear about this horrible story. And then my pager would go off and that, that became my patient and wow. it just, ugh. so I, I stopped watching the news. <laughs> Like I'm just no. You guys don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. And then um, I tell them once I got done. Well, once I transitioned out of that role, and went back towards education, I had phantom pager syndrome, and um, I could feel my pager going off, and I didn't have my pager anymore. That's a thing. Um, or I would hear it in the middle of the night because whenever I was working nights, um, the pager would wake me up. 
and I would, you know, go to the hospital and do what you needed to do. And oh gosh, I hate pagers now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's really but, funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, mad, yeah. mad respect for um for the people that are able to do that. I, I transitioned out of it because I realized it was taking its toll. And despite the fact that we had a wonderful team um, that really cared for each other and did a good job of debriefing on a very regular basis, that uh, I, I just, I, I wasn't going to last much longer. I was getting so burnt out. Um, and I, uh, I didn't want to be in a position where I started to become callous because you can't be calloused with these types of patients. Um, you had to be on your A-game. And so I, no. I, I kind of decided, you know, I need to go back. Um, I need to, to take a break um, because I don't want to get so burned out that I can't think um, the way I need to think and that I can't be as affective as I need to be, you know, with these vulnerable patients. And um, I didn't want to get jaded. And so, um, so I transitioned to uh, teaching high school. And that was kind of where I made the jump. Yeah, but huh. um, huh. I remember I did an exam in the burn unit and um, there were some concerns around why this patient was just laying on this couch and was burned over you know, 95% of their body. And so they wanted us to go in there and do a physical injury um, description and document the physical injuries. And I remember it's like, what can I put on this diagram? <laughs> you know, they have no skin. Um, the only skin they have was in the areas of sparing. So their armpits, their inner thighs, and then doing an exam on that patient um, and collecting evidence on that patient. Cause there was some concerns that she had been sexually assaulted. Oh my gosh. That was one of the hardest exams I did. And on top of that, I mean, you're in the burn units, it's like 115 degrees in the room and you're Right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, I walked out of there like feeling like I was just drenched. Like one of the one of the two times in my life I've ever felt like I was gonna pass out. I was in a room with a patient who was 95% burned. Yeah. And I went in there with the, the two burn nurses and we were I was I was learning burn debridement and learning. Um yeah. to be a on-call burn tech before I became a nurse. Man, that's a rough job. And um and sure enough, we were in there and I remember like, you know, just being so hot and I was all, Ooh. Uh -huh. and uh, the nurse goes, you need to step out. <laughs> no, I was like, I was like, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm cool. I'm good. Yeah. And she's like, you need to step out. You're not used to this heat. You're not used to all this gown, yeah. like everything you're gowned up. She's like, step out, cool down and come on back in. I'm glad I did. Cause I probably would have went down. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. You know, that was the cool, I mean, I've got mad respect for burn nurses. I mean, burn nurses have a free right. pass to heaven in my book because right. I mean, you just need to like celebrate and open the gates and be like, come on in. We've been waiting on you. Um, yep. But it, it was so funny because they were like, uh, I don't know how you do what you do. And I'm like, I don't know how you do what you do. And so it was this mutual appreciation. And you have those moments where it's kind of cool because you're both nurses you know, but yep. you do totally yeah. different things, but, um, yeah, completely different things. You know, it's, it's fun to have that level of respect for, for other specialties. Um, because I think sometimes we get caught up in this idea that, you know, we're ER nurses, we're the badasses of all nursing and that that's okay. I mean, true, yeah, true, they're, but they're, yeah. That ain't, it ain't wrong, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's cool to, you know, to kind of think, man, our nurse, badasses yeah they're badasses too yeah they are for sure and then uh I, I, I sent you that article um the other day with um Ernest Grant and it talks about his background you know and experience as a burn nurse and so it had yeah. it was extra special to me because I remember back in that moment where I was with that burn nurse and my job is really hard and her job is really hard and we were working together to take care of this patient. And I walked out of there thinking, I do not know how you can do this every day. Um, and I'm sure she probably could have said the same thing to me. <laughs> I don't know how you do this every day. Um, but we do it because our patients need it and we want to be really good at what we do. True. And how cool was it to have the, uh, the president of the ANA? Uh, oh, reply back. 
and be like, fly back to you. Wants to call me cool. Dr. Owen. Oh my gosh. I was fangirling That's all over the cool. place. That's pretty cool. It was really it's pretty cool. So but it's cool to think that we have somebody like him at the helm because I mean, he's a badass. You know, he's not one of the administrative people, you know, where you kind of transition out and you kind of forget what it's like to be at the bedside. And now you're in this massive leadership position. No way. No, that's not him. Um, so it's cool that he's representing us on that level. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's always been a talk a show. Talking about how hard right? nursing is. Nursing's hard. Yeah. <laughs> It is hard. It's a hard job. Man, but it's so fun. It's it ain't easy, but it's heck, worth it. Yeah. It's worth it when you do heck, it. Heck yeah. So fun. Yeah. Now being able to I've eat. never regretted it. It's one of the, the things I tell people is you'll never regret becoming a nurse. No. So no. And, and that's that's the cool thing. I mean, I had a lot of guilt for wanting to transition out of forensic nursing. Um, because I felt like, oh well, you know, you just can't hack it you just can't hack it anymore. I'm like, no, I mean, it was me being able to really kind of advocate for myself to be able to say, you know, listen, it's, right. it's not fair to me. It's certainly not fair to my patients for me to stay in this role you yeah. know, when I'm struggling, yeah. you know, because of the things that you see every day. I mean, I did, yeah, um, true. I did 300 exams in a year and a half. And there are some forensic nurses that won't do even close to that in their entire career. And it just, it, it yeah. wears on you. Um, yeah, I bet. But and then again, I mean, I was hired as a teacher with zero experience and into a school district system that I had no clue how to function in. And they thought I was like the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, <laughs> That's you know, cool. um, so there was a lot of autonomy there and I got to figure things out all over again. And it just, it was just in a different environment and man, I'm so glad I took that role. That was such a, um, it led me into where I am now. I mean, just my love for education and really, you know, being, cool. being one of those people as you are to, when you see people that have the potential to be really great nurses, like you want to you want to carry them and be like, man, I know you can. Yeah. Let's do this. Let me let me show you the ways. Yeah. And exactly, it takes exactly. a village to raise a great nurse. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's a great. Yeah, group. it takes a village to raise a great nurse. So, you know, it's true. I just want to be part of everybody's well. village because I I love nursing <laughs> that much. And if education is my gig and my opportunity to to be in that village, then heck yeah. That's super I mean, cool. Yeah. So that's yeah. cool. It's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you me. having me. Thanks for listening to the Art of Emergency Nursing Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Facebook.